Welcome everyone. This is Stani, the podcast that celebrates uh, African scientists. And I'm your host, Alex Nyako. I'm a senior research specialist at David Dennison. And I'm hosting today's session with Salasi Wiafe Kwache, and I'm a postdoc at the University of Maine. So today we are very excited to have with us Dr. Kwame Ousu Deko. Kwame is an associate professor at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences in the University of West Florida. So Kwame, thank you so much for joining us. We are very excited to have you here on SANI. Uh, thank you both for having me. I'm really excited to be here. All right, so we'll, we'll get straight into it, Kwame. So we'll, we usually like to start by trying to get a sense of the, the background of our interviewees to really understand how they went into their career path. So how did your past experiences, how did your past upbringing, how did your schooling influence and shape your career path in the current field that you pursue? Okay, yeah. Um, so usually when I get asked questions like this, I don't start from as far back as I'm going to start from, but because you use the word upbringing, um, mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, born, I raised, went to school, um, up until, you know, up, up until college, you know, in Ghana and I, I lived in Kumasi. Uh, my parents, you know, uh, are university professors, um, they're both retired, but still, you know, teach on contract. And um, so I guess, you know, that is, you know, somewhat privileged background in Ghana, you know, not, you know, swimming in money or anything like that, but, you know, exposed to a lot of people and circumstances mm -hmm. and things like yeah. that. And so I think I just realized or was aware of that privilege, you know, and I went to a very, I'm, I'm very surprised I'm using the word diverse to describe Ghana, but economically diverse <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. where you know because um you know you had like the lecturers kids you had people in the city who were like you know the movers and shakers and you had people you know who you know parents were struggling to make ends meet and so i think that experience really one well, made me recognize sort of the economic privilege i had but it always made me also curious about i guess issues of poverty you know and so at the time i didn't notice that but that interest was what drove a lot of my other um, uh, interests, you know. And so, for as far back as I can remember, as a child, I wanted to be a lawyer. I do not know why. <laughs> I just wanted to be a lawyer. Like, nothing else made sense. Nothing else excited me, you know. I, I think about doctor, engineer. You know, you know, in Ghana, we you know, pushed very early mm -hmm. into a field, you know, with the sciences or, you know, humanities or social sciences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I wanted to be a lawyer, you know, I said I was going to do arts. And uh, my parents were not very excited <laughs> at the thought, you know, uh, because they were like, well, you're smart, you know, you should do science. Uh, but I insisted. And so the compromise was that I do um, arts with elective maths, you know. Mm. And so, uh, and I hated maths. I still hate maths. Like, I'm very, very bad at it. <laughs> um, I just don't have to do it as much or even at all. You know, I'll say as much now. And so I, um, yeah, I went to a secondary school. That's actually, you know, how I, I met uh, Alex uh, in Prosec. Um, and even there, I just, I guess, again, I, I wasn't realizing the connections at the time, but. Um, the subject that really interested me was geography, you know, and I did very well at geography without even trying, you know, I was always mm. curious about what's mm. going on yeah. in other parts of the world and things like that. And so um, I get to tech and by that time I'm very determined, I'm like, I'm going to do become a lawyer. Like, uh, yes, that, that's, this was the agreement. I fulfilled my part. <laughs> I did the emails for you. I'm going to become a lawyer. And then they come in with another curveball. They're like, oh, you know, it's not good to be a narrowly trained lawyer because, I, okay, so because I grew up in Kumasi and I grew up mm -hmm. in university campus, I wanted to go to tech. That was also another thing. I was like, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to invest in science and technology. I'm not going anywhere else. It was sort of my my university, you know, uh, uh, goal. Um, but then because I was toying with the idea of being a lawyer, I was slowly becoming open to, you know, going to school in, 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 in Accra, in the of Ghana. 
But then at that time, right about when I was about to enter, tech started a you know first year uh, or first degree law program in LLP. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so then I was like, yes, everything is perfect. We need you to slow down um, on the law because uh, you know all the lawyer friends we've talked to um, see that it's not good to be a narrowly, narrowly trained lawyer. You don't want to do an LLP in law and then go and do your, you know, the, 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 the graduate uh, degree and all of that's law, law, law. Like you need some of the background to be more well-rounded. And they went so far <laughs> as talking to a former Supreme Court justice, you know, whom they knew from some other circles. And then he was like, yeah, 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 it's, that's very good advice. You shouldn't be an Irish in law. So I was like, fine, I'll do something else. And again, my father had been pushing for land economy as the first okay. degree. But again, because of my struggle with mathematics and I, because of that, I also struggled a bit with economics. In, mm. so, so I heard the word economy. I was like, no, I'm not <laughs> in life economy. I'm going to do development planning, you know, and I didn't even really know what development planning was about. But I, again, that was a compromise that came to like, okay, fine. If we won't let you do law, but then uh, do development planning. And so development planning is basically about just, um, uh, organizing uh, organizing space and um settlements and infrastructure development social services like everything you know from the perspective of ghana it's basically how would you plan a country at all levels so you could take it from mm-hmm. as very little as a neighborhood all the way to national issues you know and so we we learn all those skills and how to plan for all those skills and, and sectors and I, I actually fell in love with it. I remember having a conversation with a friend in the first semester. I was like, I don't think... And he also wanted to, you know, do planning and then go and do law. And I, I told him straight up front, I was like, I don't think I'm going to become a lawyer anymore, you know. I'm really enjoying this, you know, because I saw so many, you know, pl- one thing that really excited me about planning was it was really concerned with poverty alleviation and really concerned yeah. with you know, yeah. helping people who don't have as much as others have you know which i think had been sort of my life sort of experience and ethos and so um yeah i i i did development planning and by that time i was hooked i probably wanted to work for an international ngo or something um but then when we f- i finished tech and then i did national service um I, I lived in a village, you know, so um, I was teaching. It was, it was basically like a short term missions program with um, sort of a student Christian organization. And so I was living in the village, you know, teaching in the schools, helping with capacity building programs and churches and things like that. And then one day a student asked me a question. Um, I forget, I think it was English. I was teaching English and Chi. Um, and so the student asked me a question. Um, I gave them an answer. They were not very satisfied. You could see that they were still confused. And so they asked me a follow-up question. And, then, and I gave them a follow-up answer. And then I saw the, the light bulb literally go on. on their yeah. Face. Like, yeah. huh, I want to do this for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, I just felt so much satisfaction and accomplishment. When I, like, I literally saw the student's face, like, transform. Yeah, lit up, yeah. Because they had understanding. I was like, yeah. Huh. And so, you know, at that point, I really considered becoming a teacher, but I was like, okay, this is Ghana. Um, and I saw how teachers had lived, you know, I, 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 and how they struggled and things like that. And so I was like, okay. Um, I think, again, growing up as uh, the child of, of two professors, I was like, okay, I've seen the level of, you know, quality of life my parents have lived. I think if I want to be a teacher, you know, again, compromises let me become an investment professor you know i feel like now that i'm recounting this i feel like my life is full of making compromises um <laughs> and so uh i i th- then that was that ambition and so i i i wanted to come to um, grad school in the u.s um and i ended up at the university of iowa uh, um, studying mass uh, masters in urban and regional planning and so i think when i when i when i got there i was slightly disappointed just because, I mean, I knew it going in, but I didn't realize it would be such a struggle. But this program was heavily US focused, you know, very, very heavily US focused. Yeah. And so I always found myself just like struggling to sort of comprehend what even people were talking about because it's also very 
place based and you know context specific and so i was like mm. trying to you know really understand what references they're making and what issues and policies and and all the while i'm asking so how will this play out in ghana like how could this even work you know um and so i almost felt like i was gaining knowledge that it was to be difficult for me to translate or use back back home and so i remember usually in, in in my master's program between it was a two-year program so usually in the summer between the first year and the second year you're encouraged to do an internship and so i was you know, thinking about what internship could i do i didn't you know want to leave the city but it was hard to find an internship in the city where i lived iowa city and i saw um uh, basically I call it a flyer, but basically an A4 sheet, you know, where you rip off the number yeah. and the email. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And they were they said, Do you want to be a solutionary? I was like, solutionary? Like what is a solutionary? You know, I never even heard the word before. And so, you know, I look up in the organization and it's actually a youth led nonprofit, you know, um, part of a wider organization called Grand Aspirations. And they were called Iowa City Summer of Solutions. And basically, they spent the whole summer just doing local community development projects, you know, on environmental issues, on social issues, on, you know, equity, economic, you know, um, equality, all of those things. And so that was the first time, like, I started having this connection, you know, where my interest in poverty were then beginning to merge with all the stuff I was learning about um, urban yeah. regional planning yeah. and the environment and for the first time like I saw it all connect together you know in the work of that group you know and so I was like okay I think I haven't made a mistake you know I'm, I'm on the right, the, the, the right, right track part. so I finished the masters um, and then obviously the plan now was you know school is to become a professor so I was like okay I guess I need a PhD so I ended up in the University of um, South Carolina um, um, and do my PhD in geography or human geography, you know. So again, connecting back to that uh, that love for geography in in, in secondary school. Um, and my advisor at the time, for me, I was just interested in, you know, like I said, poverty alleviation, international development, you know, mm -hmm. anything to you know sort of bring you know economic progress to you know some some parity. And so my advice at that time was working, or had just started working on some climate change projects, you know. Um, mm -hmm. He had done his own research in Ghana, so he was very familiar um, with the context and the country and all those things. And so he started working on some international um, climate change adaptation projects, you know, how human beings can get, get ready and respond to, you know, uh, a rapidly changing climate. And so that was how my own interest in climate change um, um, sort of came into the came into 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 the fold and into the picture, um, and I ended up um, doing my dissertation research on um, sea defense systems in in the Volta Delta of Ghana, um, mm -hmm. and how just different stakeholders around these systems um, uh, are evaluating you know the success or failure of, of these systems, and so you know talking to people, the national governments. The mm -hmm. people who live around the fishing, live in and around the fishing communities near these structures. Um, some consultants who worked on them, some contractors who worked on them, just trying to assess, you know, how each group, you know, evaluated them and seeing if, you know, these were good investments of, you know, sort of um, funds, you know, uh, in response to, you know, climate change. You know? And so, um, was your professor the PhD, a Ghanaian, or just was your professor a Ghanaian or from? No, no, he's an okay. American. He's a white okay. American, yeah, yeah, but he's he is anthrop geograph anthropologist, stroke geographer, and so mm -hmm. he spent considerable uh, years in Ghana. No, but he wasn't a Ghanaian. Um, um, yeah, but he definitely did connect me um, to you know that climate change space and even the current that sort of current project that helped me get back to Ghana, you know, to to work on sea defense systems. Um, yeah, so I finished that and then ended up. Uh, getting a job at the University of West Florida um, in an environmental science department. You know, it's like, okay, I feel like it's all coming full circle <laughs> now. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I guess just having that idea for that love for justice, you know, because even, uh, I guess I didn't mention this at the beginning, but even wanting to be a lawyer, I wanted to be a criminal justice lawyer. Like, mm -hmm. I want to put the bad guys, you know, yeah. <laughs> behind bars and all of those things. And uh, it just seems to come together, you know, in realizing that the the environment is more holistic, you know, than, yes. than yeah. we think, you know, and when we talk about environment, 
usually we're either referring to what is surrounding us as human beings or sort of the biophysical world around us you know but it's all of that you know intertwined and so um yeah speaking of putting bad guys behind bars you know more some of my most recent research right now is having to do with environmental justice and thinking about how especially in the u.s certain communities um are overburdened with you know pollution and things like mm-hmm. that and so yeah i guess i'm well, still trying to put bad guys behind bars <laughs> with my research that's yeah. yeah yeah that's th- that's inspiring um I, a lot of the times um i know that uh, w- when we are young and we we see people out there with their lives it looks like everything was just planned out like <laughs> right from the beginning but again sometimes after you've moved you've gone through it you look back and it's just amazing how everything is somehow connected in one way or, um, or the other so um mm-hmm. it's just an a, a, an encouragement for our listeners that even if right now you seem confused um yeah. sometimes everything does connect together yeah. um and so Kwame at this point would like us um like you to tell us more about your research on this impact of climate change and pollution on marginalized groups like in layman terms and what are the main areas and problems that your research is trying to address yeah yeah so um when we talk about marginalized you know groups you know if you take any society um those who have the least access to resources, be financial or social or um, just physical, you know. And so um, uh, when I was talking about sort of my upbringing and what interested me the most, you know, was this issue of you know, sort of the marginalized, you know, yes. um, yeah. poor people and things like that. And so in the U.S., um, marginalized groups, you know, income and race you know highly correlate you know and so a lot of uh, marginalized groups in the u.s are communities of, of, of color um and then when you look at just um impacts of uh pollution like uh, um, i said when i was talking about environmental justice a lot of landfills mm-hmm. um are mm-hmm. cited near um predominantly my uh, no racial minority communities um uh anytime somebody wants to bring in um uh, industrial sites or even former industrial sites you know you look yeah. at the demographics surrounding them and you see that and there's a lot of debate about you know which came first is it that mm-hmm. you know the, the 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 industries targeted you know these communities or after the construction or siting of these industries because these communities are you know yeah. historically placed by systemic by, yes. injustices yeah. that they ended up moving there you know and yeah. so and that's what I mean when I talk about marginalized you know, populations, just people with the least access, um, even political access. Um, they may be um, diminished um, in their even political structures. Uh, they don't really have a voice, you know, not a voice, but they don't have a seat at the table. Uh, their mm-hmm. concerns might be dismissed, you know. And so um, I guess in, in my work now, it really has... Uh, Revolved with you know, racial minority groups, predominantly black, you know, communities, and so um, to just to give a current example, I'm working with a community um, in Gulf County, Florida. It's called North Port St. Joe, and there used to be a former paper mill um, sited next to the community, operated for about sixty years. Mm-hmm. Um, so everybody worked in the mill, but then it also w- was operating at a time, you know, when the U.S. was highly segregated. And so mm-hmm. even though everybody worked in the mill, you know, black people had their entrance, white people had their entrance, you know, things like that. And so, yeah. um, and the, the the neighborhood, the black neighborhood was literally separated by the ra- ra- railroad track, you know. And so the mill eventually shut down. Um, everybody lost their jobs, you know, but because there was already, already this sort of racial inequality yeah. and segregation, uh, the impact was worse on the black community and they also live right next to them you know? so when we are tracing health impacts and uh, contamination of the soil and the water a lot of it is uh, in, a, in and around the black community and so um a group of them the, the black residents you know banded together to try and revitalize mm-hmm. you know the, the community try to bring you know just you know the economy back try to bring jobs back and um uh they've the, came up with a, a, a development plan, all of that, but they were really struggling to find funds, you know, because they needed a significant 
amounts of funding to do that. And so um, a group of researchers, which I was involved in, came together to provide technical assistance to them, you know, to write and apply for some of these federal grants. And they've won shoot, almost like, at least for federal funding, almost $900,000, you know, oh, wow. in the space of about two years. Wow. Because that's, of you know, that group. That's also. amazing. Yeah. And I think even the private funds, if you add private funds, they're probably getting close to a million dollars. Um, so now the struggle is because of, again, that historical segregation, they have a very fraught relationship with their city government. Um, mm-hmm. And a lot of the visions that they have, they stop short at getting city approval. You know, supposing they want to change the street, streetscape or they want to, you know, mm-hmm. have different kinds of buildings or they want to mm-hmm. even re overhaul the, um, the the drainage you know in in the, in the neighborhood they would need city council approval yeah. you know and support you know and so because of that for a relationship you know they have lost out on a lot of projects that way and so our most recent effort is really trying to repair that relationship get mm-hmm. them in conversation with the city government get them all together in a room and really reflect on like, okay, what are the issues at hand and how can we actually move forward together as one, like, united community, you know? And so I think that's really what my, my, my research revolves around, just connecting, you know, communities that have not had access, mm-hmm. just right have access to resources, connecting them to those resources, providing support, building capacity, facilitating conversations, um, um, yeah, bringing in other expert, ex- experts, you know, because my research is mainly like qualitative, and so um, yeah, I I I'm I'm not uh, an expert in like soil sampling and uh, air, air, air quality sampling, all those things. Yeah. I'm working yeah. with sampling, yeah. but I, other people are, and so finding you know those people and connecting, um, coming together as a team, you know, a, a collaborative team, and so I. I highly, you know, believe in team and interdisciplinary science. You know, like I, I just know that we can't solve any of our problems. You know, yes, yes, we try yes, to do it yes. in, in silos or try yeah. to do it you know, yeah. alone. And so, um, and because this is, a, I guess I didn't mention that this is a coastal community. So because it's a coastal community, uh, they've had to deal with hurricanes and other things like that. Mm-hmm. So that's where the climate change bit comes in. And so thinking about knowing that our climate is changing, knowing that. Uh, our seasons will not be the same how can we be prepared for an incredibly hot summer like we'll be experiencing now how can we be prepared for a very intense hurricane season that florida um probably will might get another one you know uh, this this, this fall and so um and how can we make sure that even in rebuilding or bringing this community back uh, the things that we're building are resilient to you know to, extreme weather events yes. uh, are cool enough in extreme heat you know things like that yeah. uh, so that we don't just uh, think about only the present but we're thinking about the future while you know, as well yeah that's that's very interesting Carmen. i think one key point that you mentioned really sticks to me is the the critical need for interdisciplinary science especially in a time where we really need to bond our efforts together looking at one primary objective and how we can each bring our expertise into solving a problem that would eventually lead to the onward movement of our, of our various communities. Mm-hmm. Um, so Kwame, I wanted to ask Ness, what does a usual day as an active researcher look like? Um, primarily for up and coming scientists in, in Africa who are looking to also get into um, a, a role similar to yours. Yeah. What does an yeah. active researcher day look like? Yeah. Um, so before COVID, <laughs> it looked like you no, know, always going to you know, the office <laughs> and sitting at a desk <laughs> and you know spending copious amounts of time on the computer. Uh, it's the same without always going to the office. <laughs> um, so typically now, um, I will only go to the office when maybe I have classes to teach as well. A lot of my work I do from home again because I'm not like a, a laboratory scientist or like event scientist, you know, mm-hmm. labs and you know all of these things uh, to do. Um, I can do a lot of my work uh, remotely, but it's just reading, reading a lot, you know, just uh, finding out what the literature is saying, uh, finding what other people are saying about the, the topic, uh, looking for 
answers to questions um and i didn't realize this but now a lot of my work is involves a, a lot of emailing people and especially if you do research that uh you know revolves around connecting people you know and yeah. working with yeah. people like i send a lot of i was like i didn't realize i would send a lot of emails but i'm always sending and drafting emails to somebody and asking some something and trying to have a conversation and setting up a meeting you know with people to talk about you know issues mm -hmm. or to plan a certain project or things like that um i mentioned because of this interdisciplinary or team approach you know to science yes. Or solving problems, you know, I have to spend a fair amount of time in, in meetings yeah. um, and then reviewing documents. And we try to cut that down sometimes, you know, because sometimes just meeting is not always the most effective use of our, our time. And so um, if we can review something over email, we'll do yes. that, yeah. and send documents back and forth. Um, if that saves us a meeting, we'll, we'll do that. But um, yeah, just uh, digging, you know, I, I think over the course of my, especially. But yeah, over my PhD years, I really developed a knack for finding information. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't, like, I know even when, when I'm doing, like, Google Scholar searches, yes. like, I know how to word things to find you know, different kinds of kinds of things. Like, if I'm looking for a specific article, I'm not finding it. I, 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 I don't know. I seem to have developed this skill of, okay, I know if I change it or I, I even change the order of the words, <laughs> you know, I I'll find yeah. what I want, you know, yes. so yeah. um, it, it involves just a lot of data mining, you know, and I, I, I'm not using data mining in a very technical sense, you know, but yeah, just yes. digging for information, you know, and, and really, really trying to, trying to search um, is what typically my research day, you know, looks like. Um, okay. And so just a follow up question um, in terms of like your meetings, um, how, 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 uh, just for for um, our listeners to get a clear picture, how do, do some of those meetings look like for um, a researcher that's working on climate change and pollution? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, it, it depends. Some of those meetings are, you know, very, very small. And I think I prefer smaller meetings, you know, with three, four, maybe maximum five people. Um, because I think usually when a meeting gets too big, uh, especially a Zoom meeting, you know, yes. people yeah. just tend to um, mm -hmm. be in the background, don't turn on the cameras, you know, yeah. uh, that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah, but typically, um, uh, you know, or typically always have an agenda and somebody should have done something by the time okay. that we meet. And so okay. we'll follow up on, you know, did you look up this data? Um, did you okay. ask this person what you're supposed to ask them or follow up on that, you know? Okay. Um, have we recently done any field test? Kind of yes, okay. exactly. Have we done any kind of field test recently? What were the results? You know, we said we're, we're waiting for some soil samples to come back. You know, um, 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 have you heard anything back? You know, from the lab about that and, th and things like that. And so, um, yeah, the, a lot of it is strategizing, planning, okay. Um, okay. and then yeah, just uh, getting updates um, from people as well there's been a few meetings where we've actively sat in and written something mm -hmm. um like a, a communication piece or something piece. like that um, okay. i'm not a big fan of those but the mo the most recent one i did it was very productive and i think we'd have, okay. it was better that we actually sat down because we spent like i think f three and a half almost four hours total working on that and I had been in meetings the whole day so i was not very excited by the time i went to sit <laughs> in that meeting but the goal was accomplished so yeah. sometimes you, where you need to get something done and you're like okay let's just sit together. let's just all sit in and get it done yeah yes. mm -hmm. um wow that's that's i'm i'm, I'm pretty sure that would be, that's kind of different from maybe what some of our listeners are used to when they hear about researchers and so right. what are some of what are some of your memorable highlights and lowlights in your research so what have what have been some really fun moments um and then some like down moments yeah i think i'll give the down moments first <laughs> i'll get those out of the way <laughs> i think for me one <laughs> one of the the biggest down moments was <laughs> when i got my first uh journal not just rejection because you know usually when you uh, submit it a scientific journal or peer review journal you there's a desk reject from the editor where he's like, no, yeah. this is not suitable for it. No, that, that wasn't too bad. 
but when I got reviews and the reviews were like <laughs> skating and they were just like I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> the literal lady has, you know, rubbished yeah. you know, everything yeah. that I wrote, you know. Um and I, you know, this is you know, the have you know, because this was something for my PhD, you know, that I had submitted to for publication. And so come on the highs of, you know, oh my gosh, your PhD, your PhD is so interesting and exciting and hearing all these things and just getting a job and, you know, thinking that, okay, like I'm doing something right. And then <laughs> you send your work into the world and, you know, it's shredded, <laughs> you know, and the reviews are horrible. And that even wasn't so bad. Um, it was after I responded and revised, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, you know the the, the the basically the second round was even worse because um so i'm throwing my phd advice a bit under the bus here uh it's not it was it's not even his fault but it was just you know something i assimilated you know by proxy um you know, you know by the time i worked with him he was very accomplished he was associate professor for a while mm, mm. almost about to become full professor all of those things mm. and so he had very little patience for general reviews and he okay. would always rant and rave and complain, you know, about that you know, feedback he got and how reviewers don't understand what they're doing, blah, 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 you know, and just you know, make a lot of noise. Um, and that was, you know, verbally. Um, I rarely ever saw the actual reviews he sent in, you know, but the impression he always gave me was that that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to, like, make noise and, like, <laughs> complain and, like, you know, defend your work, basically, yeah. you yeah. know, and, and, and point out to them how little they know about, like, basically re-school them in your responses you know, so my naive self in my replies was like okay i made all these changes blah 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 and then one one reviewer came back and said i remember it so vividly he was like and uh, he was complaining to the editors like and uh, the author is even so far as going to insult i did not insult him but i guess i was not also polite in polite my yeah you know. and he's going back to the and said he you won't get fire in science with this kind of attitude and it was very very soul crushing you know because i was like <laughs> I thought that's what I was supposed to do, you know, but that was definitely a wake up, you know, call. Yeah. Me. Um, and then, you know, obviously my approach has totally changed. Now, even when I think even there is this, like the, what I mean, I should do is needless. I'm like, okay, what does it hurt to do it? And I'll, I'll mm-hmm. calmly say in a very strange, you know, yeah. uh, a written tone, I have addressed the reviewer's comments, you know, end of story. But that, that, that was a very difficult uh, experience you know because again yeah. i thought i was you know doing what a scientist is supposed to do you know sort of defend your work and um i think a, a lot of times you don't realize the science is that no matter the kind of science we're doing whether it's you know physical science or you know social sciences or engineering or w- w- whatever it is mm-hmm. it's sort of a human process you know we're still working yeah. with other yeah. people and so there's a, yeah. is a lot of people management even yes. in peer yeah. review and all of these things and so it's mm-hmm. like um, mm-hmm. i think to that was good advice to get far mm-hmm. you know you, you really have to be you know so sort of savvy with people um so i think that was one of the the, the low low, uh, low points the second one was just applying for grants and getting rejected mm-hmm. and reject, like continuously like just continuously like i was like oh my gosh like because you spend so much time and energy and yes. effort you know, yeah. to put together a grant yeah. application yeah. You know, especially in the team and you're, you know, wrangling people for things, you know, up until the deadline. And then they're like, sorry, you know. And I think for me, it was just, especially when it was like the same grant where you like, you re- project or you repurpose to different funders and still mm-hmm. like after two, three, you're still getting rejected, you know. So that was also a real low point because I, I, it almost made me wonder if the project is any good, you know, mm-hmm. is the research any good, you know, should I be thinking of something else you know so that, that even up until now i think it's still a low point you know yeah I, i'm i'm much better if i get in a first rejection or second but when i do like two three times and then yeah. i still yeah, yeah it's, still, it's still a low point <laughs> for me um high points i think was just finally receiving recognition you know for for my work so the first one was when mm-hmm. i got an internal university award as an early career researcher because okay. in my mind i'm not that good of a researcher you know in my mind i'm a better teacher than i am a researcher yeah, and i remember i even had this um conversation with my phd advisor you know right right when i was i was taking this job or about i don't think i don't even know if i'd officially signed the paperwork maybe i had but he was trying to convince me to do a postdoc mm-hmm. um, before you know instead of taking this job and i was like well because i also had gotten a postdoc 
you know, at the University of South Florida. And I was like, you know, it's like this is a tenure track job, you know, significant pay, you know, difference. And I, f I feel like I was told like to get a tenure track job is sort of the goal. So if I have it now, you know, what's the yeah. point? It's like, well, yeah. but, you know, it's a different, you know, sort of tier of university, you know. I don't know if uh, listen, all our listeners are familiar, but, you know, um, the U.S. universities have tiers. So there's Research One and we call them R2, but regional, regional comprehensive. So I'm at like a, a regional comprehensive university. So mm -hmm. we're not like a high research you know, producing yep. you know, institution. And so I think my advisor was concerned. He thought maybe I was underselling myself or, you know, getting trapped in, you know, I don't yep. know, place yep. I wouldn't be happy. And yeah. so I remember telling him that no, I'm I'm not confident in my independent research activities. I, I I'm very confident as a teacher, so I'm very happy going to a more teaching heavy school. Um, and so in my mind, I, I was like, I yeah, I'm a better teacher than researcher. So the first time I got a research award, I was like, oh okay, I guess I'm doing something right, you know. And yeah. then yeah. getting to other research fellowships after that. Um, um, also just you know sort of validated okay i think people see something in me and in my work okay. and the portfolio that i have that maybe i don't see myself and so that that was that was a high point with just um, a validation that yeah i i shouldn't think as less of myself as i do um when it comes to research and that you know mm -hmm. i probably do have, <laughs> do have uh, you know I, I do have stories to tell the world so yeah yeah so come so, i wanted to do a follow-up on that yeah. same question yeah how did you deal with your low light what were the tactics you used in dealing when you had to be beat down with all of those uh, things that happened yeah yeah um so and this is something i'd heard from a lot of other you know academics and researchers was you know to leave it alone like let it sit you know when you get those bad speaking you know reduce, reduce those rejections like just leave it alone you know because again i another problem i had that very first time was that you know i sat and just let it build and i was seething in it and you know i was just angry and annoyed and then it was in that frame of mind that i wrote my responses you know and so mm -hmm. i was not even in a good frame of mind to even take any you know constructive feedback at all but i realize now that you know when i get disappointments or rejections and i just leave it alone because there's other stuff to work on there's, there's family stuff to deal with like there's so many other things you know vying for our attention and so i'm like mm -hmm. okay leave it alone deal with other things and then when i come back to it usually if i give it like two weeks sometimes or even a month i can actually read them like okay now i see this differently like this was actually making a very very bad valid yeah. point you know maybe they didn't yeah. have to say it so meanly you know and that's something <laughs> I, I try to do when i review research papers i try not to be me like I, I do my very very best to you know kindly point out you know, and also emphasize to the author that hey these comments are really to review like uh, improve the quality of your, your paper like i really think you have like something here and if you, you make these changes it will be clearer and even better you know for and so that's one thing that's really helped me just leaving it alone and then coming back to it later you know because usually i'm in a different frame of mind i'm more open to hearing that but yeah, um, yeah. all right so so Kwame, one one thing that we we're doing uh, as we were sort of researching your your yeah. work as well as your background was noticing that you had a very special interest in increasing diversity and equity in, in stem fields um, can you shed more light on your work and how um, you've been going about achieving this objective. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I've talked already about you know team and interdisciplinary efforts, and I think that's one thing that I've learned even in trying to increase the diversity and equity in STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and, and, and mathematics. Um, because again, I think not I think in the US, you know, when we talk about diversity, we're we're referring a lot to race, you know, um, and ethnicity and, and all of those things. And so for me, you know, as an African, you know, scientist, you know, in the United States, you know, I do, you know, um, just try to um, seek out, you know, um, other students, you know, like myself, you know, with similar backgrounds who may be interested, you know, in, in doing science. And um, one thing I do is that I sort of, pro bono like i don't have a company or anything but you know just one one-on-one -on -one connections you know i have offer people advice you know if 
they're wanting to you know come study in the u.s you know yeah. um, i yeah. ask them like you know what do you want what do you want to do what programs are they looking at you know mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. i'll review your statement of purpose if you want me to you know things things like that you know um more recently i got uh in the data with a lot of random requests especially for people who are specifically wanted to apply to my my program and so it's more difficult mm-hmm. for me to address those but i remember even once of a student who um wanted to you know come to our university i think i don't even know if it was to do a phd or something and i was like oh we don't we only we only um, undergrad and masters and then i think i just looked up some because he's and he i think we didn't even do the program that he was interested in and i just looked up some possible programs like hey you can look into these programs and the, the student was so so grateful they were like thank you so much like this is the best response i've received ever yeah. and, yeah. and mine was even a you know a, a no you know but yeah. they were very very like sort of grateful you know and so i think that that is one thing i um, institutionally i've been part of some efforts to um improve um mentoring practices of stem faculty you know mm-hmm. just to make them more inclusive of the mentees culture and background and all of those things mm. um a lot of um sort of normal people have not had the opportunity and access to scientific resources you know and so yeah. um i think anything that i can do to, to help that you know um if i um i sometimes intentionally seek students i remember one time there was a summer research opportunity and i asked two students whom I figured in my mind nobody who would, would have not would ever want to work with them, but nobody has probably thought to ask them, "Hey, would you want to do research with them?" Because they may not be the students with the highest averages or yeah. GPAs. Yeah. And so I I approached them, and they were like, "Like, wait, like you want to work with me?" You know. And mm-hmm. but then I think it was a very very fulfilling experience for them. You yeah. know, and yeah. you know, I still hear from them, and they're, they're both doing well and things like that. And so. Um, those are some of the efforts, you know, just being intentional about who to ask, who to involve, um, giving people who may not have opportunities, opportunities, you know, I think a lot of times for students, uh, just knowing that the professor notices them or is aware that they sort of exist as a human being beyond, you know, that sea of faces, you know, is uh, usually very encouraging for them. So those are some of the efforts. There are some more institutional formalized efforts where we organize workshops, for other faculty members um, but then also just intentionally you know reaching out to students and you know um, just pro bono helping people who may be interested in similar yeah. similar career paths yeah hmm. that's that's um very inspiring to hear um <laughs> and 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 it's encouraging to know that there are people that are also are working to have everyone feel included um, because I think in the academic field, it's very easy for to be in school and not feel like you're a part of a community. And so that's um, one of the things that I think it's very important, um, in, especially in the STEM field. And so Kwame, to finish up, um, what advice would you leave for our listeners who are young and aspiring scientists in Africa, um, looking at all your your total experience so far? That's a big one. I was really reflecting <laughs> on this one. Um, I think advice is, um, yeah, like I, something to reference something you said earlier that don't be too worried uh, if you seem confused, if everything doesn't seem clear. Um, be open to opportunities. Be open to go different directions. You know, yeah. um, I think for me, just again listening to the advice of my parents. You know, I, in moments that I didn't want to, and sometimes making compromises. Mm-hmm. was sort of opening the door to what you know i was really going to enjoy i didn't know it at the time yeah but sometimes you know um making those compromises a lot of times we have these dreams of this is the school i must go to this is the course i must study this is these are the things i must do and if that doesn't happen if you get a different course get a different school be open to those possibilities um life will not always play out the way that we want it to um, mm-hmm. but i think when we are open to different experiences and open to you know those different trajectories you know sometimes we end up where you know we we really really enjoy without realizing that that was it so that that openness um that flexibility and i think also just that humility um something that you know a viewer told me uh, that you know I, i think i did take to heart but um, I think you, a lot of times you don't hear the word humble and science, you know, sometimes go together. Yeah. But yeah. having a humble science, not saying that 
you don't um talk about your work because as a scientist you know you have to talk about your work you have to explain your work to other people but then i'm realizing that you don't have all the answers uh, one student mm-hmm. of mine put this you know very beautifully and you know i always like to reference her and uh, she said um we may be right but only right now you know yeah. it's like we may be right but only yeah. right now you know yeah. that all we're sure is that we have the answer right at this moment but it doesn't mean it's going to be right you know 10 you know 20 but have how many years to come and so just that i think that's what i mean by humble science you know because a lot yeah. of times scientists can get very very they can really dig in you know to their work and uh what they've done and what they believe and all of those things and just realizing that yes you're also uh, influence you know by your own upbringing so i'm glad you also asked that question because a lot of mm-hmm. times scientists are like well the scientific method is objective and standard and we have no bias but you know our life experiences and our upbringing and even our training you know predisposes us to think certain ways and see certain things you know right. as well and so i think just having that <clears throat> the humble approach to science that okay i may be influenced by something I'm, i i should listen to this even though it sounds different you know that yeah. actually take it in hold yeah. it up to the light examine it you know, yeah. you know and and see yeah. if you know i need to change you know what i currently believe mm-hmm. you know what i currently my kind mm-hmm. of practice you know for this thing that might actually be, be better i think that openness to always grow always learn um and sort of take a risk i'm maybe wrongly so the kind of person who will hear an opportunity not have all the details and jump in you know and then figure it out you know and usually when i do that <laughs> um it kind of works out just because a bit of it is like okay i have to make it work out you know like i already said yes to this so yeah uh, I've, I, I, i've got to make it work um, but and that might not be for everyone but i think that openness um and just uh, recognition that i don't have all the answers and probably never will um, mm. has helped. so i think those are two good things yeah just don't don't be so sold on your dreams and how you need things mm. to out because then something in a place that you never even thought to look yeah yeah awesome so be open be a humble scientist and just just be open to opportunities so once again I want to thank you Kwame for joining us we've enjoyed um talking with you learning more about your life and more especially about climate change and pollution on marginalized groups it's been an amazing experience just listening to you um and so to our listeners out there I hope you enjoyed this um time with Kwame and um once again you can find us on Facebook as Sunny on Instagram at Sunny Podcast and you and on YouTube as Sunny Podcast don't forget to like share and subscribe and send us your comments anything that you would want to hear about more and um just let us know what you um what you find about today's episode see you at our next session okay. bye bye